Okay, now should be recording. I don't know. Let's see. Okay, let's start. So welcome everybody and uh, thank you for joining here. So today, as uh, the announcement went, I want to discuss about uh, one dimensional matrix models. And I want to motivate that they can be actually physically rich. So this, uh, this uh, title is quite a bit uh, abstract and hopefully as time progresses during the talk, uh, I will try to be more informatic. But uh, uh, since it is a, it is a quite a bit big topic, I, I would like to keep things a little bit simple. And this is to be seen mainly as a review and an introduction to the topic. And one different way to uh, discuss the title, to rephrase the title, is that one-dimensional models can be non-trivial, or my interpretation is exactly this uh, triangle, which, uh, as we will see later on, uh, one-dimensional matrix models, they can be connected with string theory and M-theory. Hopefully, I will convince you how this uh, works and the motivation behind it. So that's, that being said, let's uh, start uh, discussing a little bit uh, uh, the main part. So in this talk, I will consider usually variables uh, to be matrices in one dimension. And as you already know, everybody, a matrix has diagonal and non-diagonal elements and the size is given by n by n here. So to connect a little bit with Tasso's talk, um, when somebody discusses a one-dimensional problem, you have, for example, a particle here, and you parameterize uh, the trace that this particle leaves, which is called word line, and you use a parameter which we usually call time, to parameterize. And in fact, someone can actually write an action about this uh, concerning uh, the particle and the motion. And one can actually use a massive particle and interactions that can be physically consistent. But today I want to discuss a similar, the similar problem, but uh, instead of smooth functions, I want to have matrix valued functions of this model. So now I want to consider very schematically the same problem, but here, instead of having a function that gives, for example, the parameter, the, the position of the particle, I want to use a matrix. The motivation behind this, it will become hopefully clear later on, but the, the idea is that one can actually uh, write an action about this uh, uh, model, which can have, for example, the kinetic term, okay, and a potential term. Now here, this is a commutator, and this can actually be seen as some sort of phi to the four interaction, because the commutator, if you expand it, you have four times x. Okay, so naively, in the same analogy, you can think that you have a particle that uh, has a potential which is like this. Okay. Do you take the trace of the term? Sorry? Do you take the trace? Yes, the uh, I will take the trace right now because now what I want to do is I want to get a UN symmetry on this model and consider I number of matrices. Uh, so can I ask, do you have any kind of constraints for what type of matrices X can be? So you, in general, like no. Or something like that? In general, no, but usually to discuss about observables, we use Hermitian uh, matrices, so symmetric real matrices. And this will be the case in what follows. So now I want to gate a UN symmetry <clears throat> and to keep the action gates invariant, uh, I take the trace over the whole terms and the cyclicity of the trace actually ensures that this action is gates invariant. 
So now I also included uh, I of these matrices, which means that I have to sum over uh, the kinetic term and also the potential term. And since, since now I have a gate symmetry, which I will consider to be a UN, the covariant derivative on an observable acts in, in this way, okay, where A of T is the gates field of the theory. So now the idea is that we have a one-dimensional model which has a UN gate symmetry. And I have I matrices which describe the point particle at parameter T, so exactly here. Now I want to uh, sketch that this system shares exactly the same Hamiltonian, so has exactly the same formulation with a, a spherical bosonic membrane. So, and this is a case when I have just three matrices. So let's imagine that we have a spherical membrane, okay? And we want to embed this in a higher dimensional space. So the, the embedding space can be quite arbitrary. There are no constraints in what space time I will uh, embed this membrane. So one more question, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Um, so in your definition of the covariant derivative, mm -hmm. maybe there is an O missing from the first derivative or uh, not? Here, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes, right. So this would be right. Thanks. So uh, this is the Nambu-Goto action here of the bosonic membrane. And H alpha vita is the pullback metric, which is taken on the surface of, of this bosonic membrane. And yes, yeah. And uh, this uh, X mu and X mu are actually the embeddings. So when you pull back the metric on the surface of the bosonic membrane, you take the derivatives with respect to the embeddings. And since we have a two-dimensional uh, surface, because the surface of the bosonic membrane, the spherical membrane, is two-dimensional, alpha and beta run from one to two. So, in fact, somebody can prove that if somebody uses the Polyak formalism, when you uh, add this cosmological term in the axiom, you can write the axiom as follows. So you can write it again with a covariant derivative, which uh, is defined as above. And here, <clears throat> there is an additional term that appears as the Poisson bracket. Now, the Poisson bracket appears if you consider uh, the determinant of this uh, matrix here. So this here is a matrix which actually has uh, it's a two by two matrix. And when you take the determinant, it will appear, for example, here you will have, um, this will be one, one, and again, you will have two, two. And in fact, you can easily convince yourself that the Poisson bracket appears here. So if you naively see the form of this action, and the form of this axiom, you see that they somehow look like each other. I have to mention here that the coordinates on the sphere, which is the sigmas, they are chosen with a normalization that when you integrate along the surface, they give four pi. Now, of course, I'm skipping a lot of details here, but if you want to see a better uh, formulation of this and how precisely it works. This is a reference, the matrix model of M theory by Washington Taylor. Strato, no. uh, shouldn't the alpha beta indices be one to three? Uh, Isn't the no. 3D metric? 
it, no, because actually you can use constraints. And so what I'm trying to write down here is I'm trying to write down an action, a, a metric, let's say the pullback metric is on the surface of the bosonic membrane. So it's not 3D surface, the pullback? Because you no, have no. D3 sigma. No, no but yes. So here you can consider that this is TT, D square sigma. And this, this, this D sigma, this D square sigma describes the alpha and beta. And this is another parameter, which is the time. But what I want to, I want to pull back the metric on the surface of uh, the bosonic membrane. Actually, okay. Okay. the embedding metric, let me call it gamma. And gamma will be... So you can use the constraints to prove that the 3D metric coincides with a, a pulled back metric on the surface of the bosonic membrane. So this is along the lines of the usual string formulation when you have time reparameterization or general reparameterization, then you have constraints. The same happens here, and you can prove that what matters is the, the metric on the surface. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So now, if you really look, if you take a closer look to these actions, as I mentioned, they seem that they look like each other. And this was actually used by the Witt, Hope, and Nikolai. And uh, they used a regularization map, or if you wish, a, a quantization procedure, where you actually um, substitute the Poisson bracket with the commutator. So this is what we are familiar with, but there are also some other ingredients that somebody has to take into account. So the idea that is that you uh, take coordinates on the sphere, which uh, are the embeddings actually, and you map this to SU2 generators with a specific normalization. Okay. The Poisson bracket maps to a normalized commutator. And the two-dimensional integral is replaced by the trace. So let me not go into details of this regularization map, but the procedure, this procedure, what it does is to map the action of the two dimension of the bosonic membrane to the one dimensional metric, which consists of matrices that I discussed above. In other words, the, this matrix, this metric upon regularization, you can map it to this metric here. In fact, you can also do a Hamiltonian formulation because of the constraints or the procedure that you have. This is, again, a usual string theory procedure. It can be found in any string theory textbook. And when you do that, it results in a Gauss constraint, which tells that the Hilbert space of the system consists of gates singlet states. In other words, the constraint is written like this. And in this case, actually, in the bosonic membrane interpretation, you have that the gates group is again UN. And it is UN because this can be seen as a diffeomorphism group on the surface of uh, uh, the sphere. And by this, I'm, yes. What is a Gauss constraint? So a Gauss constraint is a. Um, is usually uh, is a procedure that results from the Dirac algorithm. So the Dirac algorithm is an, is an algorithm that uh, constructs the quantization techniques of gauge theories. And the name Gauss constraint is coming from electromagnetism. When you actually, um, so you can, in electromagnetism tells you that the flux through a surface is zero. 
Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, I mean, the name Gauss constraint is motivated from electromagnetism because you can motivate, you can do gauge analysis of electromagnetism, and then you have a constraint, for example, about the flux. Now here, uh, this constraint, it is, consist it is written like this. And, um, well, to put it differently, this is a procedure that pops out from the Dirac uh, analysis of the system. The Dirac analysis is an analysis that treats the system with uh, first class and second class constraints. And I mean, I'm not sure if it makes sense to proceed into more details. Perhaps, yes. perhaps we can discuss later if you wish. Yeah. But the, the idea here and what is important is that the diffeomorphism group on the surface of a spherical membrane can be seen as UN. And this was a work done by Goldstone and Hope. And I think if I remember correctly, it was around the 70s. Of course, what is crucial here will be to take n to be very large. So the correspondence is exact when you take the n to infinity limit. Now, I want to uh, deliver this message at this point is that uh, on the left hand side, we have a one dimensional model, which has a UN gates group. It has a specific action and I number of matrices. Okay. And on the right hand side, we have a 3D membrane. It has again the UN gates group, as we saw, as a diffeomorphism group. It has another action, S2, and uh, we can do a matrix regularization. So when the number of matrices is three, there is a dual description of these models. So with a one dimensional model, somebody can describe actually a membrane moving uh, in a space time and tracing a world volume, specifically a world three volume. So the idea is that uh, so far I discussed about bosonic membrane, but this is uh, indeed true when somebody considers also supersymmetric membranes. And this again was done by the Withop and Nikolai in 88. And some years later, in 96, uh, four people, namely Banks, Fisler, Saskind and Senker, which uh, they also are known as BFSS, they use this model to conjecture that it connects with M-theory. So this, in the beginning, seemed a little bit of a bold conjecture, but the idea, the main motivation behind this is that M-theory contains the supermembrane. I will not discuss in many details M-theory, but what is important is that the supermembrane in the context of M theory is a two dimensional surface in 11 dimensional space time. And what they did was to, uh, they, they proposed that if this duality holds here, there should be a way to describe M theory by using one dimensional matrix models. But the conjecture was done in very, very specific limits. And these limits were, uh, first of all, that you have to go to the light gates. And secondly, you have to take the infinity, infinite momentum limit. So I guess that many people are familiar with the light gates formalism, but, uh, uh, but even if you're not, it's not really a key ingredient of the construction. But what is more important is this infinite momentum limit. So this infinite momentum limit is given as n divided by r, and you have to take first n going to infinity, 
and then r going to infinity. I will explain what n and r is by giving you, um, I think, an easy example. So this is actually a quite trivial example, and it is trivial. Uh, despite being trivial, it's actually quite powerful, if you understand it. And this is actually the idea behind all Kaluza-Klein reductions. So let us consider a massless scalar field in uh, three dimensions. And let's write down the Klein-Gordon equation like this. Okay, so I have uh, the deriv second derivative acting on the field is zero. Let us now consider the manifold to be not R3, but let's compactify one dimension and use the isomorphism R2 times S1. Now this R here is actually the radius of the compact dimension. And what I want to do now is I want to write again the Klein-Gordon equation in this manifold. So when I do that, I can use the symmetries of the manifold to break the operator of uh, the second derivative of the D'Alembertian. And it breaks like this. I can also use the symmetries to expand the three-dimensional field to a two-dimensional part times a phase. K here is the momentum, and I guess we are familiar with this. So now this, the second derivative, so the second derivative of the two-dimensional uh, space will act only on phi two, and the other derivative will act on the phase. When doing this, you take, um, when you differentiate this twice, you get k squared, and k squared can be written as n divided by r. So this is actually the momentum that runs on this circle. And what you see here is that you start from a three-dimensional massless scalar field, because there is no mass term. And by just, by just compactifying one dimension of the manifold, you get a Klein-Gordon equation, which is massive. And I hope this is this, this trivial example to be as illustrative as it was to me. So this actually infinite momentum frame connects with some momentum running on a compact circle. And indeed, the question I want to ask now is what it, how does this connect with M-theory and what has it to do with M-theory uh, whatsoever? Now it is, I think, um, if you have encountered a little bit string theory and M theory in your academic lives, you might are aware that the M theory is actually a web of dualities that connect the different string theories. And there is a connection that at least I understand better than the rest. And this is a connection of the type 2A super string theory with M theory. And the former, so the type 2A superstring theory, is defined as M theory compactified on a circle. So the compactified dimension has again a radius. This is an S1. And the radius is actually connected with the string coupling and the string tension with this formula. So taking G string to be very big, which means considering strongly coupled string theory, equivalence to taking a big radius, okay? And if you have an S1, and then you take the radius to infinity, for example, then it is naively this can be understood naively as a decompactification of the space-time, because when you take 
a circle and you push it all the way to infinity, it opens up. And therefore, you don't have really compact dimensions. Okay. And in fact, there is a correspondence between M theory and type 2A superstring theory. And for example, you have co uh, ingredients of M theory, like the supergraviton with a specific momentum. So this is equivalent to a D0 brain in type 2A string theory. You have a membrane, the super membrane uh, that is in M theory. And when this membrane is wrapped around this uh, circle, it gives you the string. When it is not wrapped, it gives you a D2 brain. Now these D brains and strings are of course, of course, ingredients of uh, super string theory. To put it naively, D brains are the endpoints of the string. We will see this a little bit later also. So the idea is that we take when we take when we discuss this uh, correspondence, we have a momentum that can be defined as n divided by r11. So this n here is actually the number of times that we go around the circle. So when we take the large n limit, which means to take many to go many times to wind up many times around the S1 and then take the air, the, 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 the big radius limit, it is possible that we can describe M theory. But before doing that, if we do it, let's give you um, a pictorial representation of what we try to do. So the connection between all these three models, the, the triangle I saw in the very beginning, is that you have M theory in 11 dimensions. When you compactify on S1, you have type 2A super string theory in 10 dimensions. And in fact, this can be seen type 2A super string theory when you take the low energy limit of and these zero brains, this can actually be written as a one-dimensional matrix model. But what we want to understand is the opposite idea. We want to use this one-dimensional matrix model, then uplift it to 10 dimensions, and if possible, take also the R going to infinity limit and study M theory. So I will not discuss much about this, but I think it is more important to discuss about uh, this correspondence and how it works. So the question is, how does this uh, one dimensional model maps to 10 dimensional superstring theory? Well, the answer is that it has a kind of weird holographic construction. And holographic should be not taken too seriously because it's not the conventional holography that people are familiar with. So let us discuss this. So the idea and the whole, the essence of this topic and uh, all this construction is that everything is contained in this matrix that I saw you in the beginning. So as I told you, the trivial statement is that it has uh, diagonal and non-diagonal elements. And the claim is that the diagonal elements here can actually, they describe positions of T0 brains and non-diagonal elements given by blue, they describe open strings stretching between them. I think this idea is understood better when you use colors. That's why I used colors here. And uh, 
I mean, intuitively, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because as I told you earlier, uh, when you have, for example, a deep brain, then the deep brain serves as the endpoints of the string. So let's say that I have the I and J brain. So this string going from I to J, you can write it as the state I, J. So this I, J are known as the Shan pattern indices of the string, which are furthermore indices of the UN gates group. And the idea here is that the entries of the matrix, so the indices of the matrix themselves can be seen as these indices. So when I have, uh, for example, x11 is, it denotes a string starting and ending on the brain, on the D0 brain 11. On the other hand, I2, uh, 12 is a string stretching from D01 brain to uh, D02 here. And in this sense, actually, these represent closed strings, while uh, the blue lines represent, they represent open strings. And in a sense, they give the closed strings here, the D0 brains give a meaning of locality in the theory. And the whole idea of the, of the holographic construction is that for each dimension of the space time, you have one matrix. So here, this index i runs from one to nine, okay? And this nine here is connected with this nine, which describes the nine special uh, dimensions of your space time. So we have nine matrices giving information for n d0 brains. Okay, so this is not the familiar or conventional holography that uh, may, some of you know already, uh, but it works like this. Are there any questions so far regarding this uh, picture of I or idea? Okay. Fine. Sorry? Sounds fine. Okay. So now I proceed to give to, to, to show the action of this model. And the action of the model is written like this. So here N is uh, the rank of the matrix or the number of the D0 brains or the number of degrees of freedom, whatever you wish. And lambda is the truth, the truth coupling def defined by the coupling of the theory times the degrees of freedom. Again, we have an integral over the parameter time and we are tracing over the terms. So here, the difference between the previous action that I wrote is that I have added also supersymmetry fermions. So we have nine bosonic matrices. I runs from one to nine. And we have 16 Majorana vial fermions. I will not discuss the fermionic part because it will not be very relevant, but I will focus mainly on the bosonic, uh, on the bosonic terms and then use supersymmetry when needed. So if you do dimensional analysis of this theory, you can find that the dimensions of the truth coupling is energy cubed. So it is not zero. And therefore, we don't have a conformal field theory. So this theory is not conformal, but it is quantum mechanical. Quantum mechanical. See, we don't have a, conf we, we don't have a, a dimensionless coupling, but we can actually construct one by 
uh, we can construct an effective dimensional scattering by dividing with uh, suitable powers of energy. And with this coupling, we can actually um, we can actually control the regimes of the theory. So far, okay, I guess uh, since there are no much questions, I guess everything kind of makes sense. But I, now I want to uh, try to connect this whole construction with gravity. And to, to do this, I want to understand first the solutions of this model. So if you if I write the potential terms, so I mean this and this, and ask for extrema of this potential, it is easy to prove that I have extrema or solutions of the model whenever x i are zero and c alpha are zero. So this means that solutions of the model or extreme of the potential are matrices for which, which are zero, both bosonic and fermionic. Now let us try to understand what this means. This means that all matrices are zero and furthermore, since I have real and symmetric matrices, this means that the entries of the matrix of all matrices are zero. So for the non-diagonal terms, we don't care much, but we will care for the diagonal terms. The diagonal terms, we say that they give a meaning of positions of these zero brains. So now imagine that we have N D zero brains, which they sit together on the zero on, on the origin of the coordinates of the nine dimensional space time. So that, that's what actually this, uh, this equation means. It means that for all I and capital I and small I, I have N D zero brains sitting on top of each other on a specific space-time point. And the question is, okay, so this probably should back react in a specific geometry. And the question is, do we have a geometric interpretation of this? The answer is yes. And the interpretation is this one. So in type 2a super string theory and specifically super gravity, there exists a solution that solves the 10 dimensional Einstein equation, which describes in fact, this precise setting that we have. We have n coincident D zero brains, which stay together. And there is a metric, which is also known as the black zero brain metric and it is given by this form. So this is important to say that this is a, some sort of black hole in 10 dimensions. And the difference is the dimensionality first and then the little bit of interpretation. Let's not uh, discuss much about this, but the point is that since I have, uh, I can put a horizon by using this function. And this R7, so this power here is because of the construction of describing D, uh, black holes in terms of D brains. So the idea, the geometric naive interpretation is that I have N D0 brains forming the core of my geometry. I have a horizon, the usual black hole horizon. And this metric is valid in the near horizon limit. So it's only valid around here. This is a very well-known procedure in studying black holes and I will not discuss further. 
But what is important to know is that since there exists a horizon, there exists a temperature for this black hole because it is thermal. I can find the temperature and it is given uh, by this equation. And then I can use actually thermodynamics. And when I use thermodynamics, I can write the energy. The energy is written like this. I have uh, a constant times n squared times the funny power of lambda because lambda is dimensionful here. And I have also a weird um, exponent. Of course, this is the supergravity uh, description, but I can also have corrections coming from uh, string theory and alpha prime or even finite n because the supergravity holds only in the large n limit. Since I know the energy, I can use the first law to write the entropy. And the idea between the two, so the holography or the correspondence, if you wish, is given completely in terms of this effective coupling. So this is dimensionless. So we can use, we can use some sort of ADS CFT like correspondence. But here, I, so I tried to put it in this form, but uh, you shouldn't take it too much seriously. I'm just trying to tell that when this effective coupling is very large, it means that we are here and this is the supergravity. So this geometry. So this is the so-called bulk of the theory, which is 10 dimensional. And on the other hand, we, when we take G to be very small and we can do perturbation theory, we are in the boundary, naively speaking. Now the boundary is the matrix model that I discussed previously. Now notice that we have a correspondence between one dimensional model and a 10 dimensional model. So this is completely different from what people know usually in ADS CFT because, for example, in ADS CFT you have a, a d dimensional gravitational theory and then you have a d minus one CFT. So you always your gravity is always one dimension more than your uh, gauge theory. Here I have from one dimension to 10, okay? And the idea that this works is I ex as I explained here. Okay. Strato. No, yeah. So uh, in go a little bit up, the HR for the black hole, what is D zero? What is that parameter? Yeah, so, so these are the, this is a number. So this is like uh, 240 pi to the oh, okay. 5. So it's just and lambda, lambda is the coupling. Lambda uh, is the truth coupling. So you use the, so that's supposed to represent the mass of the black hole? Uh, no, so why the mass? So isn't there is only one parameter from the gravity side for the black hole, the mass? Uh, it depends how you see it. For example, I, I prefer to use temperature as the parameter. Okay, okay, but... Um... Usually, so you can fix lambda to be uh, an order one number. Okay, it's like, uh, I don't know, like one. So when you fix lambda to be one, then you can study uh, the model, both sides at this precise setting. So fixing lambda equal to one means G young mil squared times N is one, okay? Or you can equally well use the, the truth large and limit when you take lambda to be 
very large and then you take the large and limit is this uh, what you're referring to uh, yes uh, i was just asking what is the mass of the black hole in terms of this parameter so then the mass appear in the f function that you have there in the solution here you mean yeah i mean i guess here is the mass oh, yeah, I yeah, think yeah yes so, yes and can you explain why is this only a near horizon? Uh, why is this only valid near horizon? I was thinking that these solutions that, I mean, which is basically like the usual D brain solution with this extra factor are supposed to hold it everywhere, right? This one, you mean that you have, uh, here usually you have plus one or yes. something like this. As, so the only reason you say it's near horizon is because you consider this R to be small here now. Yes, exactly. Okay. So R going to zero means that we are approaching the core of the black hole. Yeah, so I mean, uh, you could be more general and leave the one there. Yeah, yeah, okay, sure. yeah. Sure, yes. So so I'm confused. Why isn't there in the black hole just the mass of the black hole at the end of the day as a parameter? So what is lambda supposed to modulate? Lambda there's modulate. Not a, there's no charge or anything, right? No, no uh, the charge. Uh, no, I, I, I think that the, there usually appears the number of the deep brains you have, mm -hmm. and, uh, and also the Kepler constant, Gs or something. Yeah, so yeah. here yeah, this is G young mil squared times n, okay? So n appears here, so n can be seen as the charge of the D0 brains. Right? Uh huh. But from the supergravity 10D, what is, um, how do you get this? You use the duality between the parameters? Yes. G, G Newton is one over n. For example, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, this, so this is constructed in terms of uh, the gauge theory. Um, yeah, so, so my confusion is just from the black hole, so I expect to have the mass of the black hole as the only parameter. Of course, there's G Newton there too, right? Yeah, uh, G Newton, yes, but the you can think the mass of the black hole given as the number of uh, D zero brains, because these are the ones that construct the black hole. Okay, and the more the more the n, the more the mass of the black hole, and this actually give the charge and the, the mass of the black hole. So, but you, as I explain later, uh, because I will put this model to a computer and usually what we do is to fix Lambda. And when we fix Lambda, we can play with N and such that and we do it in a way that this lambda is fixed. Perhaps, I mean, maybe I don't understand the, qu the question correctly, or if you want, we can discuss about it later. Yes, yeah, sure. Maybe it will become clearer for me later. Yeah. So the, the idea is that you have a temperature here, and then you have an energy, and using the first law, you have, again, you can write the entropy for this black hole. So if there exists a duality between these two, uh, there should be the case that we can reproduce one from the other. And indeed, there are analytical results, but soon they become very difficult because we are in a matrix nature. So basically, you can do indeed calculations in the gravity side, but then how do you compare with uh, the matrix model? Because to understand the matrix model, for example, when you write down the equations of motion, you have equations of motion for an n by n matrix. And when you take this n to be large, I guess it is understood that uh, things can be really non-trivial. So indeed, there have been done some analytical uh, works by many people. And to put it simply, uh, most of the 
most of the things that can be done have been already done. But nowadays there are there exist uh, Monte Carlo simulations, and Monte Carlo simulations is actually a non-perturbative way to test if this duality holds. So the idea is the following. We take i, n by n matrices. We fix n, so we take a big matrix. And then we do Monte Carlo simulations. So we can put this, uh, the matrix model side and put it in a supercomputer. So from this, we can actually start study the large end limit, for example, uh, by simulating in different uh, parameters, we can extrapolate the results to the large n limit. In a sense, finite n corrections, they are related to quantum corrections because uh, the idea is that when you take n to go to infinity, your gravitational theory is, or even the matrix theory, they become classical. So in a sense, H bar is related by one over N very naively. Taking the large end limit results in H bar going to zero. And indeed, we can try to understand if there is a thermodynamic analysis that we can do and compare eventually with gravity. So this was, um, so this indeed start started so some people started doing this back in the 2010 and it was put it forward by some people and different groups and i am part one of these groups and they we are known as the monte carlo string m theory collaboration collaboration or uh, mcsmc for for uh, uh, like the acronyms so what we do is to put the BFSS model on a one-dimensional lattice and do this on a supercomputer. So this one-dimensional line that we parameterize with T, we essentially break it. And then we have the lattice points that construct this circle here, for example. And the periodicity gives you the temperature. So what we usually do is to take a matrix of uh, an arbitrary size, let's say when n here is 12, and consider, for example, 48 lattice points. So 48 lattice points construct the circle. And we do this in a canonical ensemble. So we fix temperature. And then the energy is defined from temperature, okay? And we see, when we do that, we see stuff like this, when somebody can do that analysis. So here I have plotted all the matrices. So this with different colors give you the matrices. And here on the X axis, I have the Monte Carlo time. Now, the idea is that usually you have to wait something like 48 hours to take a few trajectories, depending on the parameters you are using. And it's quite regular that somebody uses uh, a few hundred cores per simulation job to produce these kind of trajectories. And even in simulations, things can be quite difficult because of resources if you use very weird parameters. For example, if your combinations of N, S, and temperature are in that way that you cannot get meaningful results. So usually when N and S are large, things start becoming difficult. So here, for example, I have shown I saw this Monte Carlo history, and this 
portion here corresponds to one week of simulations. And this is for a specific, uh, for a very precise job. When you want to take the large end limit, then you have to take, for example, um, here 16, 18, etc. And here, when you want to study continuum physics, you have to also simulate, for example, 72 to take more lattice points. And then by doing this, you can extrapolate to large end and continuum physics. So, Strato, what is the y axis in the plot? The y axis here is the size of the matrices. So, this is a trace x uh, i squared. And this can be seen as some sort of uh, radius. So, how big is your matrix? The fluctuations of the entries. To put it simply, for example, okay. uh, it gives you the positions. So the analog is the positions of the D zeros. So here you see that the D zero brains they form some sort of a bunch. So they are uh, for they are sitting together in a finite position, since the fluctuations more or less are similar. So now with this being said, I want to discuss one of the best non-trivial tests. And this is to understand if we can reproduce the energy of the black hole by simulations. So what we do in the simulation regime is that we fix temperature and find the energy by uh, the function of um, by the find the energy via the temperature because we are in the canonical setting. <clears throat> so when we do this here on the right hand side, I have a plot that on the x on the x axis we have the temperature, and on the y axis we have the energy. This black line here corresponds to the energy predicted by gravity. It is this one. And these points here are the simulations that have been done. Now, as we go to this direction and lower the temperature and the energy, we go to the strong coupling regime where we expect the gravity description and the matrix description to converge to each other. And that indeed, that's what we see here, for example. So the question now is how to understand this deviation from the gravity line. So what I told you is that this black line here, this is predicted only using classical gravity, classical supergravity. So when you actually include alpha prime corrections, and these are something, this is something that has been analytically done by some people, so you can actually get corrections of this energy. And they have a specific form. And what people saw in the matrix uh, simulations is that these alpha prime corrections, they uh, agree with analytic results taken from the supergravity. So you have supergravity and you insert alpha prime corrections analytically, this can be calculated. And then you see that these two descriptions agree. And this is something which is very interesting because as I told you, matrix models and this Monte Carlo simulation, they are non-perturbative. So it holds to all orders because you don't, you're not using any uh, parameter to expand. So the simulation went up to here in 2016, but now what we're trying to understand now is to push even more to this regime. One important point here is to say that if these two descriptions 
wouldn't agree, it could be a way to potentially falsify the correspondence. So what we are trying to do now is to understand better what is happening in lower temperatures. But as we go to lower temperatures, there is a, a claim by these people, Itzaki, Maldasena, Sonnenstein, and Yankelovitz in 98, that as we go to low, temp to low energies, we are going to, uh, from left to right. So we are going to this direction. So here you see that we have the type 2A description when we have these zero brains. But then as we go to even lower temperatures, seen by here, there should be a transition from string theory to M theory. Now, I, I will not discuss further what this means, but I want to say that indeed we can see this transition from the matrix model, and then we can compare with uh, some results from supergravity description. Okay, so this brings me to the take home message. Um, I started in the beginning and the title of my page of the, the title of the talk was that uh, one dimensional models can be physically rich. And rich in here, I hope that I gave you a flavor of uh, what this means. So I want to say that one dimensional matrix models, matrix quantum mechanic models can be fun if you uh, handle them with care. And somehow they seem to know about string theory and potentially also M theory. The point is that they soon start becoming analytically intractable because of the matrix nature. But then we can use Monte Carlo simulation in supercomputers to understand how they behave and compare with analytic results coming, for example, from this uh, super, super string description. One other point that I didn't discuss is that uh, you can use certain parameters to understand better, for example, transitions. Um, so in the conventional ADS-CFT, there is uh, a parameter which is called the Polyakov loop. The Polyakov loop, it is defined like this. So you take the trace over path ordered uh, exponentials and AT here is a gauge field. And this parameter can be actually used to distinguish between confinement and deconfinement. Um, I will not discuss in much details, but I want to highlight that this confinement to deconfinement transition here, it is connected with Hawking page transition. So a Gates, a Gates theory transition is connected with a gravitational transition, the Hawking page transition in the gravity side. And indeed, we can use also this parameter to describe confinement and the confinement transition in matrix models. But the, uh, the, the understanding in the gravity side is a little bit more complicated than the conventional ADS-CFT. The last point is that there exist more uh, quantum mechanical models, either one dimensional, for example, one well known as as well known as bfss is the massive deformation because bfss does not contain any mass but you can deform this model with a mass and this was done by uh, berestein maldacena and Nastase a few years after this model appeared and this model has its own glory and it has other features some of them are more interesting but there is also another zero dimensional matrix model, which is the type 2B uh, matrix model for string theory. With this, I would like to thank you for your 
patient and I would, I would be glad to uh, take any questions now. Yeah. So, so they I have keep, a uh, question. So they keep recording have... or? Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. So about the uh, page transition that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So you don't see it in the graph, in the energy with temperature. No, it's uh, the point is this Hawking page transition holds, for example, uh, for the conventional ADS-CFT. But I said that this is mm -hmm. the, the conventional ADS-CFT does not really apply here. So we don't we don't really have a Hawking page transition in the gravity side. But uh, to give a little bit more details, what so some when when why not? Because um, it is not understood in this setting how this works. Another point, so, so what people believe in this <laughs> setting is that this confinement, the confinement transition, it corresponds to a Gregory, a Gregory Laflamme transition in, in gravity. So a Gregory Laflamme transition means that, for example, uh, you have, uh, so it, it regards a topology change of your gravity. So you have a black string and by changing the parameters, then this string collapses to form a black hole. Very, very, very roughly speaking. And people believe that this confinement, the confinement transition corresponds to a Gregory Laflamme instability of the gravity side. Now, to give a little bit more details, uh, what I mean by that is that you have, so this is the 11th compact circle, okay? And you have a string wrapping a black string wrapping this uh, circle so you can use the temperature as a parameter and study this model and you can actually claim that by changing the temperature this uh, black string collapses to not a string but it collapses to a localized black hole along the compact dimension. So this is the Gregory Laflamme instability. And uh, some people believe that this confinement, the confinement transition connects with this instability in the gravity side. So it's not really the usual Hawking page transition you see. So it has a different interpretation because the interpretation of holography here is different. Is it? Uh... Okay, yeah, well, we can discuss. Yeah. Later. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, about your earlier stuff, a uh, very simple question, try to understand. Mm -hmm. you, you described this uh, nine dimensional, I mean, a model, a matrix model, not nine dimensional, I mean, with nine uh, bosonic uh, matrices. Mm -hmm. They are bosonic. Uh, uh, so, this number nine, I suppose, is crucial to obtain the correct scaling of the energy with respect to temperature. But um, I, I didn't understand why, for example, why can't I use a different number of matrices if I want to, uh, you know, like 20, so that I becomes 20. Now, of course, I will not claim that I'm describing 10 dimensional uh, string theory here, mm -hmm. but I, I wanted to understand how do you see that uh, this number nine is important at the level of the matrix model, 
Is it supersymmetry? Is something, uh, you know, at the level of this matrix model, what, what is the number nine? Uh, how do you, uh, why nine and not any other number? That's what I at want this, to ask. Yeah, at this precise level, number nine is very crucial to construct the type two A string theory, super string theory. Now, of course, super string theory lives in ten dimensions and not more oh, because sorry. of. So, sorry, uh, I I'm talking about the matrix model. Mm -hmm. In principle, this matrix model has nothing to do with string theory. It's just a matrix model. Yes. That's the model of uh, n or i matrices, n by n matrices. Mm -hmm. So uh, what? If I, if I didn't know that this has to do with some string theory, why should I choose number nine? What is special about that? Uh, why i has to be nine? You know, because I, for example, you have the technology to play the same game, I suppose, in uh, Monte Carlo for any number of i. Is that, is that true? Or there is a specific reason why i has to be Nine. This is just a model. This is a matrix model. It can be yes. an interesting model by itself. Yes, yes, indeed. So I can be arbitrary. The mm -hmm. choice of nine in this specific case, I think, is precisely to describe string theory. So it is uh, an input that we put that we use. In principle, for example, you can neglect fermions, okay, mm -hmm. and you write a bosonic model exactly so when you use i to be 26 then people expect to find the bosonic so, uh, string theory in 26 dimensions i of course can be very arbitrary okay and so there is there are some works actually that consider to to be completely uh, so they usually connect it with D. Yes. And then they do some large D analysis, whatever this D means, and they try to extract useful results. For example, yeah. okay. so it is nothing forbids you to consider I to be arbitrary. But what this means, then the interpretation you have is that you have partons, not particles, but partons, so bunches of particles in a space time which is of dimensional i plus one. Good. Uh, so, um, right. Uh, so, for example, uh, if I take i to be uh, four, uh, do you think that there is a gravitational description uh, I three, for example, like you said uh, before? Is there gravita possible gravitational description uh, for such a system? Is there a black hole that you may want uh, to compare? So, in in a, in another way, my my question would be: If you put I to be uh, arbitrary. And if you make the calculation uh, uh, you did to find the scaling between the energy and uh, the temperature, of course, that will depend on I before you find the scaling to be 14 over 5. Now you will find it to be something else. Does this scaling uh, have something to do with uh, what you expect from a black hole in these particular dimensions uh, or that you know only works in the case of uh, i equals 9 or uh, 26 that was my question so does this scaling tell you that whatever i you choose you have a gravitational description that is re relevant to a black hole that was my question uh, yeah good question the 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 short answer is I don't know. And a little bit longer answer is that uh, it depends on what you're trying to describe. 
because not all gauge theories have a gravitational dual. So what is crucial uh, is, is a conjecture, right? Huh? Yes, exactly. So what is crucial is to is uh, for example the form of the action you are proposing. Hmm. And in principle you can add here whatever term you like such that you take the correct let's say the correct or whatever you expect from the gravity side but whether or not this is something general that uh, holds i don't know it it just it seems that it thing. yeah it works it seems that it works so far for specific eyes and in specific limits as i described in the beginning because you should also remember that you have this uh, infinite momentum limit and you have the light concave. So it, in my opinion, it's quite specific to be generic, but there might be some examples that it works. Um, okay. And anybody else, some other uh, uh, questions? Uh, if I may just uh, proceed, I just attached uh, some uh, related work. It, it reminded me of a related work that I did uh, some years ago. Um, and uh, Okay, okay, we won't, we won't discuss this here, but I, I just want to mention that uh, uh, this kind of uh, matrix models were also used for the usual ADS correspondence um, because uh, this uh, bracket potential Xi bracket Xj uh, could be used uh, to, to find an effective potential for the D0 braids. And this effective potential, it looks like a gauge theory potential. The effective potential uh, is, uh, is the potential between the D0 braids. This looks like a gauge theory potential. Uh, so, People then thought that, ah, okay, this matrix model may be related to gauge theory uh, in, in particular. That's, uh, now, and then there are generalizations for the number i to be large. You can even make uh, a large uh, d, as you call it, large i uh, expansions, which lead to interesting uh, potentials. So I just uh, attached this uh, this paper that uh, you know maybe you find it uh, interesting uh, or relevant uh, to discuss at some point. Yeah, sure. I will. I will have a look at it. Yeah, it would be nice if one can have a look at it and see uh, the relevance of, uh, and this goes more into the direction of uh, the mate. It's not actually the matrix model. It's like a field theory. It could be, it could be reduced to a matrix model, but uh, it's more in the direction of um, what you mentioned before. Before uh, Thanasi says something, can I ask another question, a slightly different one? Yes. Again, from uh, your first uh, uh, from your first slides, mm -hmm. when you described actually the the brain, um, you had an action mm -hmm. uh, which describes the embedding yes. of it uh, here. Here, okay. So. Um, um, okay, since I don't know much about that, I'm just asking. So that 
uh, is uh, a space filling brain in three dimensions. Isn't that correct? So it's a brain that fills the space, not time. Okay, mm -hmm. right. And uh, I, su I suspect that what you take here is that the, the target space is flat. Eh? Okay, so the new coordinates is flat. Yes. Is it or is it spherical? I'm sorry, I, this, this I didn't understand. No, no, no. The, the, the embedding space is flat. It's R D plus one. This is flat. Okay, all right. Now, yeah. um, in, um, so I, okay, I, I, I'm not, I couldn't see how you get this Poisson bracket there very easily. I don't uh, uh, understand that very well, but I just remind something that I said in my seminar a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. If you get the embedded space to be not flat, but you get a particular uh, stationary solution, uh, generic stationary solution, uh, which we call, it's called Zermel or Randers Papa Petru. So you don't have a, a flat space, but you have a space time, for example, which is rotating. That's another, an example of a stationary solution. Uh, it doesn't have to be a black hole. It's just a rotating space time. Uh, it has a rotation parameter. Um, then uh, you can play the same game. And what we found was that you can take actually a kind of non-relativistic limit and obtain what we call the you know, Carolian physics. So I was wondering whether you know something about non-relativistic limits of this kind of uh, brains. Um, because that's an interesting story. So you could obtain a non-relativistic matrix model where you don't have second, where you don't have a second derivative of the x variable. Like here, you have dx uh, nu square. You integrate by parts, it becomes a second derivative. But you, you may have a first derivative uh, of, uh, of the x uh, variable. So a non-relativistic matrix model. I, I ask whether you have seen this kind of reduction in these constructions. Yeah, the, as far as I remember, I didn't encounter any uh, non-relativistic non uh, models describing this. There might exist, but as far as I'm aware, I, I didn't see okay. anything. Okay, yes, um, I also don't know, <laughs> so yeah. that's why I asked. No, but that's, uh, that's an interesting main point to probably explore. So Thanasis is here with me in the room, so we can yeah, ask. I have a little bit of problems. So uh, I have a question about the, the numerics. I don't yes. know much about Monte Carlo, so I'm a bit confused why uh, if you take only 48 um, lattice points, mm -hmm. then you need so high resources. That's computational. If, if you want to do one on the color projector, what does it mean? Do you need to do a lot of run for these 48 uh, lattice points? Or so, so why do you need so many cores? Why do you need like Right, so, so heavy. it is heavy, first of all, because you have uh, matrices. And you have matrices. So for example, here, what I call a 12 by 12 means that the size of the matrices is 12 by 12. And I have nine of them. Because I here is from one to nine. So, so you need some like nine. So each one is one hundred and forty-four times nine, right? So you need like ten thousand points. Yes. So the idea is that um, I discretize 
my lattice and I take the axion of the model and I evaluate all terms on these points. And this has to be done for each individual uh, point. So in case that I have many points, this needs more time. So the idea is, and also not that here the um, the periodicity is connected with the temperature. So when I take high temperatures, I have uh, a bigger circle. And this usually makes also my simulation to be difficult. Now, I, to be uh, completely honest, I don't know precise details of what exactly is going on in simulation, simulation wise. Uh, but the, the difficulty, in my opinion, is in the nature model. Because, you know, here we have bosonic. Okay, bosonic is 12 by 12. But when I add also fermions, fer fermionic matrices, they will be again 12 by 12. And alpha, the number, runs from 1 to 16. So what is, so the 48 lattice points for it? like the example you're giving here, what does it refer to, like the number? So here it doesn't, uh, at this point, it doesn't enter the game. It enters when I evaluate the action or the terms of the action. So, so the simulation per se has only 48 lattice points, it has more. So, sorry? So it's not that, let's say, one run has, is a run over 48 lattice points. It's, as far as I understand, it's much more than that. Uh, yes, I mean, so the idea, the way I understand it is that S refers to the discretization of your lattice, and then you evaluate the model in this lattice. Now, this is just one example. You can do this for 24. You can do it for 30, you can do it for 72. And what you do eventually is to take the large S limit, which corresponds to continuum. Mm -hmm. And but should I think of each of these points having one matrix or something? No, no, no. <laughs> this spot, this, uh, you should think as these points as. Um, so I have to go back to the action. So here I write an integral over dt, but when I discretize, this is not true anymore. So I have to take the sum. And this means that I have to take, I have to take, for example, 48 times uh, so, so the yeah, a sum yeah, okay. for, for to forty eight to to evaluate this uh, the, the the terms of the action. Okay, so is it discretization over time? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, thanks. So basically, you're trying to integrate nine matrices, which are of n by n uh, sides each. Mm, you yes. might have like forty eight times that you're trying to nine matrices times that we have to it's nine bosonic matrices plus 16 fermionic 12 by 12. so okay. this complicates things a lot of, of course bosonic is much easier this is uh, i can see that but when you put fermions things become weird because also then you have this sign problem that i intellectually put it under the carpet because uh, in simulation communities, whenever you put fermions, is uh, people start worried about the sign problem. But here, I didn't discuss about this. It is assumed to be uh, controlled, let's say. And I imagine that 
your matrices are not having any particular structure, right? So they're not like sparse. They're probably quite dense or yeah, not. Yeah, yes. That's a lot of work. Then I understand why it takes some time. Yeah, that's a lot of work for computers. Okay. And can you go back to your action? Is there actually cross matrix correlations? Or could you, for instance, track X1 forever and then do the X2 at another time? I guess not. Uh, no, yeah, no, there is. Here you have, you can have, for example, yeah. a commutator between X1 yeah, yeah. and X2. And then you have actually this to the power of two. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, okay. And you also, now. you also have couplings between fermions and <laughs> bosons, and then <laughs> that's why it's analytically not uh, very tractable. Any further questions? Oops. Okay, Good. if not, it was a very nice presentation. Started. Thank you. Indeed. So then I'm going to stop recording and then we can discuss.